All right, so we are right at the start time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first off, good afternoon. I'm Jason Thomas, a project engineer here at America Makes, and I will be your host for today's America Makes TRX webinar series. Uh, just a little background on the TRX webinar series before I introduce our speaker. Um, as America Makes continues its mission to expand and accelerate, accelerate the footprint of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, this medium called the America Makes Technical Review and Exchange Webinar Series was created. By creating this platform, it allows the additive manufacturing and 3D printing community to come together and share knowledge and experience with the broader community. If you or your team are interested in presenting during the TRX webinar series, you can use the link in the chat to fill out the request form and we will reach out to you. I'll drop that link in the chat just here in a moment. Uh, a few important notes before we kick off the series. At the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for a brief question and answer session. If during the presentation you have a question, you can submit it in the chat on your Microsoft Teams screen, or like I said, you can come off of mute and ask your question directly. Uh, we will do our best to get all your questions answered. Today's webinar is gonna be on roadmap to $2 additive manufacturing for metal. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarah, Sarah Jordan of Scald. Sarah is the visionary leader and driving force behind Scald LLC, serving as the founder and CEO with a wealth of experience and a strategic mindset. Sarah has propelled Scald to new heights, establishing themselves as a prominent force in industry. Her strategic vision has guided Scald through various challenges, enabling them to adapt and grow in the ever evolving world of additive. She is known for her decision making, keen business acumen and ability to inspire and motivate her team to achieve their full potential. Prior to Scald, Sarah held key leadership positions at several companies where she honed her skills in strategic planning, business development, and organizational management. Her extensive leadership experience is complemented with her participation in networking organizations such as the president of the Worthington Toastmasters Club and the Southeast Ohio Ambassador for Ohio for Women in 3D Printing. Sarah holds a distinguished academic background where she earned her PhD in manufacturing engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, her MBA from Carnegie Mellon University, her master's in materials engineering and bachelor's in metallurgical engineering from the Ohio State University. She continues to stay ahead of the curve by seeking out opportunities for personal and professional growth, ensuring that SCOLD remains at the forefront of innovation and excellence under her guidance as CEO. Sarah, it is great to have you here with us today. I'll now turn it over to you and your team. Go ahead and take it away. All right, great. Um, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, I do want to make one correction. Um, I am still ABD, all but dissertation, so I'm still working on finishing up my PhD at uh, WPI, but that is in the works. Hopefully it'll be finished uh, sometime next year. Um, so thank you everybody for attending today. Um, to hear what uh, we at school have to say about roadmap to achieving low cost metal additive. Um, kind of want to start with an outline of, of where we're what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about school's vision and mission, why we're a company at all, uh, background where we, we've been, where we're going, and developing our additive process, which we call AMEC, Additive Manufacturing Evaporative Casting. I'll also give a little bit of background on its parent process, Lost Foam Casting, LFC, um, so case studies, and then finally getting to the roadmap of where we think um, this process and the industry are going. Uh, so to kind of give you a little bit of background of like why I, I came up with this as a topic for a webinar, we were very involved with the uh, casting road mapping that happened, I believe mostly last year um, with America Makes. Um, and that process was very much focused on uh, two processes, sand printing and then um, ceramic investment casting. Um, and it really left out a lot of the other um, additive casting approaches, including SCOLD. And, and I kind of came to the conclusion that part of a roadmap's key point is where is the end goal? Where are you going? And, and you know, of course, it's like any map, right? Depending where you're going is going to depend on your path to get there. Um, so from our point of view, our goal really is low cost additive manufacturing for metal. Um, and Kind of the bogey we've said is costs below two dollars a pound um, and in casting um, we do believe that's achievable um, obviously some other processes that might be quite a stretch to achieve um, 
So school's vision really, and this is on our website, we're not um, anything secret about this, but it's to overthrow conventional metals manufacturing and save the world. So uh, big, hairy, audacious goal uh, to, to try to really change the way conventional metals manufacturing is done, where they're doing it in big batches, high, sometimes efficient processes, but sometimes not efficiency, um, sometimes not particularly energy efficient, not very, um, you know, clean tech, maybe there's a lot of high energy intensity here. Um, and our mission is really to focus on ways to get metals parts made in the most environmentally friendly, efficient manner. Um, this saves time, money, and ultimately the planet. Uh, and we do this by developing new technologies, both for uh, manufacturing processes, as well as um, new materials. Um, some of our technologies relate to 3D printing, some of them do not, but this is kind of our overall uh, mission and vision. Um, I will say that generally speaking, the clean tech stuff, nobody is willing to pay for that. So you kind of have to find better ways to do it that have the bonus of, of being more environmentally friendly. Um, so the parent process for our additive process is a process called lost foam casting. One of the problems in the casting industry is that there are multiple processes that are called lost foam, and then lost foam itself, the way we do it, has multiple names. Uh, but the way the, our process, the way we do it, is a type of investment casting, and so that means it doesn't have. Uh, we do not use bonded sand. We do not use clay or binder or anything in the sand, um, and we also do not have a burnout step. Um, so we kind of also sometimes refer to this as true lost foam. But the way this process works, so just kind of go over this real high level, is we create a foam replica of the final desired metal part. That foam is usually made by either machining um, or more frequently by a foam blowing process, which is kind of like injection molding. Um, the foams get assembled. They get a ceramic paint applied to them. Essentially, it's like paint. It's a coating that dries. Um, and then that coating is so thin, it's not structurally sound. So even this is a type of investment casting, it doesn't hold itself like the way conventional investment casting does. It's about a hundredth of as thick of normal investment casting. So we put it in a fluidized bed of ceramic beads that vibrate to pack it very tightly and hold everything in place. Um, and then the next key difference from um, pretty much every other casting process is that there's technically no mold, although some people call it full mold, but a mold means it's a hollow space. So at this point in time, there is no hollow space. There is a piece of polymer buried in sand. Um, so what happens is they pour molten metal on top of the foam. It turns to a, a gas, um, gets vaporized, vacuumed away, and simultaneously fulfills in while it's creating the mold. And then you end up with a metal part. So this is kind of high level how regular lost foam works, um, which is our background at at school. That I've been working in uh, on and off um, in this industry since about 2000. So I kind of go over that just kind of as background so you understand our additive process a little bit better. Um, so the parent process lost foam, as I said, our big focus is on clean tech. Um, so lost foam casting uses scrap like most uh, metal casting processes, so it's, a, it's essentially a recycling process, has a number of benefits compared to conventional casting. Um, we actually think these numbers are understated because they're based on about 20, 25 year old data, um, but it's more energy efficient, less air emissions, less greenhouse gases, et cetera. Um, typically, lost foam will double your yield from a conventional foundry. Um, and from the environmental pollution standpoint, our new plant that we're currently installing, we work very closely with EPA, um, but for the current size plant we're installing, which is about 6 million pounds of capacity, did not require EPA permits, which um, is kind of unheard of in the foundry industry, but it's because there's so much less air emissions and other pollution. Um, and then going back to based on be, being based on recycling, compared to refining metal from ore, um, every ton of metal that we convert from steel will end up saving 1.5 tons of carbon dioxide emissions and four tons of carbon dioxide emissions for aluminum when you don't have to refine the ore to get the metal in the first place. So we believe this is a very potentially impactful 
um, from a clean tech perspective as well. But again, nobody wants to pay for that. You got to convince people to adopt technology um, because of other benefits. So Lost Foam many years ago um, had a lot of research done uh, and they were very optimistic forecasts for that industry. So back in the 90s, they they actually anticipated about a third of the aluminum casting industry and about 18% oh, or so of the iron casting industry would convert to this process. But it's still in a very small uh, single digits, I'm sure, percentage of the industry. Um, so I guess one lesson here is, you know, forecasts, um, you know, you have to take them with a grain of salt. Um, Lost Foam does have very similar value proposition of additive manufacturing from a point of view of di design complexity. Um, it enables part consolidation, eliminating machining, lightweighting, et cetera. Um, so I think there's actually a lot of it, lessons from that industry to be shared with the additive world. Um, one big difference in Lost Foam is that it does not have a huge cost difference um, and it can have cost savings compared to conventional casting, um, but it still has not really been adopted. Uh, and there's, I'll get to that in a second, like why that is and then how this, this all does relate to additive eventually, we'll get there. Um, so Lost Foam's adoption problem. So it comes down to tooling um, as the primary problem in Lost Foam. So tooling for Lost Foam historically would cost six or seven figures per part number. Uh, we were, we've were we been involved in early on in um, the industry where one single prototype part had um, over $2 million in tooling made for it. And then that part actually never went to production. So you can imagine that is a big problem with investing that level in tooling and it never coming to production. Um, but that tooling leads then to the problem that you have to amortize that cost across the whole batch of parts. So even if the piece part is less, um, so in many cases when you do sand casting and machining, it still overall could cost more because you have to account for that tooling cost. So that led to the next problem, which is it only really gets used historically in ultra high volume production. Things like uh, engine blocks, automotive vehicles, um, it's used in, um, HVAC compressor scroll sets, it's used in waterworks parts. Um, but if you weren't making at least 50,000 pieces a year, no one wanted to bother with this process, even if it's clean tech and can have a per price, um, per piece price savings. So very limited use cases. Um, and then the other problem of, with its adoption is most of the adoption is used captively. Uh, the people, the savings from using Lost Foam go to the machine shop. So um, that really disincentivizes foundries to use this. And it often also required redesigns. So uh, redesigns on high volume parts at big companies. And many times there were huge teams that would have to approve all these steps. And then anybody could kill the, pro any single person could end up killing the conversion. So Lost Foam never really took off to the extent that we think it could have, um, at least not yet, until it can solve the tooling problem. So that brings us to Schooled as background. Um, so Schooled got started in our journey um, due to a startup competition that was back in 2015. Um, you might know these late logos. Um, Youngstown Business Incubator and America Makes were actually the sponsors of that competition. Um, their competition is called AMP3D. I don't think it's still offered, um, but it prompted us to ask questions. What if Lost Foam didn't need tooling? We could solve this problem. Um, what if 3D printing could eliminate the need for tooling? Okay, I think now at this point, that's kind of obvious. Tooling is very common, 3D printed part across many industries. You know, what if, what if we use 3D print instead of the foam? So that was really what kind of precipitated school's um, creation as a company and trying to develop the process that has become the AMEC process. So after this contest, we were a finalist. Um, we did continue on um, bootstrapping and continuing to figure out if this potential idea could work. Um, and with time, we were able to develop the process that we now call AMEC additive manufacturing evaporative casting shown here it is essentially 
Um, the same process as lost foam. I'm not going to go through all the process steps again. Key difference is that we use a polymer 3D print, um, but the rest of the process steps very, very similar. Very thin ceramic coating, letting it dry, pouring the molten metal directly on the print to get you a replica part. So great, problem solved, right? Well, that's kind of just the beginning, right? Who cares? So what? Now what? Like that doesn't. You gotta. You gotta have applications. So what can we do with our AMEC process? The early case study I'll talk about here for a second um, was out when we were we had our business for a while out in I, um, Idaho, working with a partner foundry out there, and a customer came on Thursday. They were in the boating industry and they asked for two parts for trial prototype trials on Friday. Um, one of the perks um, in the boat companies out in Idaho is that on Friday you go Friday afternoon, at least in the summer, you go try out all the new designs on the river. That's kind of the perk of working at these companies. So they wanted the parts for trial on Friday. Well, you know, here is kind of some of what they asked for. They had this uh, these two designs they wanted. Um, 1030 steel, pretty good size, 26 inches. The larger piece, pretty heavy piece, 85 pounds. Um, had thin fins, had a thin um, plate, really critical that everything was uh, parallel between these parts. Um, and so these are the resulting parts from this uh, prototyping. Um, this is These two parts actually go together. They're a, what's called a stomp grate. They um, keep debris, and um, twigs and rocks and things like that from getting sucked up into your aluminum boat um, engine. Um, this big flat plate you see on the bottom left, that's where you actually stomp with your foot. That's why it's called a stomp grate. Um, and then these parts go together. So that's why these, uh, th these fins have to be very uh, parallel to each other um, to be able to be functional. And another thing before I go to the next slide, I do want to comment. Um, the AMEC process actually allows designs that would not be conventionally possible. Like this doesn't necessarily look like something that requires additive or is um, super additive specific, um, but having very thin, um, long walls like that in foam would be very challenging because um, foam doesn't like to be thin and long. It starts being flexible and it's not stiff enough. Um, but the other problem is that if this was in conventional um, investment casting, this would be likely to have a hot tear because having a very thin section going into a very thick section, what happens is during solidification, the material um, thermal stresses try to tear the material apart. So we don't see that in lost foam or AMEC, but certain geometries actually work better in the additive version of the process. So. For this case study and what ended up happening with this, these boat parts is we actually, they asked for it on Thursday, they asked, wanted it Friday, so uh, everybody worked really hard all night to deliver it the next day, um, less than 12 hours. And then we found out um, they had actually wanted them the following Friday, uh, so that was a little bit of miscommunication, but it did actually show um, you know, the capabilities of the process um, in a pinch. Um, the other thing that happened with this, and I, I think we know better now, but at the time we thought this was a really great price. It was, you know, more than double what Foundry would normally be asking for this kind of material, this kind of weight. You know, we charged a whole four dollars a pound. Um, so I think in this day and age, if somebody wanted something less than twenty-four hours, we would definitely be, uh, you know, pricing on value and and taking that um, expedite into consideration and in our pricing strategy. Um, which kind of brings us to the next thing um, to talk about, which is the importance of lowering additive manufacturers' cost structure. Uh, I gave a talk on this, I think about two years ago at the Women in 3D Printing Type Conference. Um, the recording of it is on YouTube if you're interested. Uh, but of all the ways to lower costs, I'm sure there are others, but a lot of them kind of fit into these six major buckets, right? Um, you can have lower raw material costs. You can increase your productivity with faster print rates with a variety of me means. You have cheaper equipment. 
you you know automate and have less labor somehow have less post processing um, and then another focus I think of the additive industry is having clever designs um, you know redesigning things could part consolidation lightweighting all of these other kinds of things to have clever designs more efficient um, printing more um, packing into one build volume instead of all kinds of ways of, of doing things um, more efficiently. So with respect to school to AMF process, um, we are able to get our prices quite low um, compared to a lot of the alternatives due to some of the things inherent in the process that tick off these boxes. So our price for is very much driven by the fact of lower raw material costs. Um, we're melting scrap. Scrap material obviously depends on the alloy, um, but for Basic steel, sometimes you're talking, you know, 20, 30 cents a pound for scrap steel. Um, obviously, metal powder wire, considerably more expensive. Um, filament's probably uh, one of the most, I guess, I guess pellet would be cheaper from that, that perspective for polymers, but it's definitely, filament is definitely also cost of, um, competitive. Um, our process is based on um, low cost desktop fused filament fabrication FFF printers. I think most people are surprised at that if they just seen the metal parts um, because we do have fairly accurate um, precision parts. Also driving down uh, costs is the fact that we are only printing the surface. So, well, sometimes we do have supports and info, but Generally speaking, we are minimizing the amount of material at, um, printed, which saves on both raw materials um, as well as print time. We prefer to have no supports when we're printing. Sometimes we do have to have them, but if we can get away with not having supports, that's better. Obviously, less post-processing if we don't have to remove them. Um, two things that we don't, we probably need to have more attention to in the longer run is less labor, more automation. Um, and then designs really, um, at least so far, we've not been doing anything where we're custom designs for AMIC. A lot of the work we're doing are either tools or legacy parts. So um, eventually, I think we'll get to some of those as well. But, and the data I'm showing here is actually also in um, that type of presentation, kind of walks through how I got to these numbers. Um, but based on prior analysis, this is kind of ballpark costing structure, and this has some definitely simplifying assumptions, and it's going to depend on you know a lot on the specific alloys and the uh, specific machines and things of that sort. Um, but these are uh, estimates based on talking to folks who use powder bed or um, binder jetting um, compared to how, how the costing structure of our aim at process. So it does definitely drive down uh, costs. And as I mentioned, with the respect to metal scrap, I think even that $2 bogey may be possible um, ultimately in some of the lower cost materials because this analysis was done for aluminum. So what else can we do with AMEC? Um, so some other part examples. Uh, we've been working in the past year um, casting, trying to cast threads as cast. Uh, we're getting some concept heat exchangers, um, doing some things that are more, I guess, on the artistic sculpture side of things, gears, et cetera. Um, a lot of the designs you end up doing in the additive world, and I'm sure this is common to a lot of folks that are at their NDA, people don't necessarily want you sharing their their parts publicly. We also have that issue. So a lot of these are kind of general parts. Uh, we've also been working on um, drawn over mandrel dies. Um, so how can others use AMEX? So eventually we started um, thinking about how can we use this um, beyond just schooled making parts. Um, a lot of people ask me like, are you going to do parts? You're going to do equipment manufacturing. And I think it's one thing to ask that question if you're in an industry like machining or um, you know, extrusion printers where there's literally hundreds of manufacturers of equipment, um, but nobody's going to buy equipment for AMEC until, until it's very clear that there is a value proposition for making parts that way. 
Um, so at least for the time being and the foreseeable future, we will be offering both um, equipment as well as parts. We have de delivered systems. Um, so our, the R&D system at LEF uh, was part of an American Makes project delivered to Ohio State. We are currently developing uh, the Lightning Metal system. You may have seen uh, part of that system on display at the last America Makes um, MMX event. Um, it's probably about 90% done, um, but it's kind of being delayed a little bit since we're installing this plant. Um, but it is coming along, having discussions with folks on that equipment. But I think it's more important really to talk about, and this is really the point of this talk, is to talk about where we are going. Um, so a little bit more detail on some of those things. So from where we are, and everybody's talking about an additive, kind of the value of additive, right? You have digital manufacturing, point of need, all these supply chain benefits like single piece flow and no inventory and, you know, et cetera. All, all these things that people kind of have as the dream. Um, that's also our goal, but also at low cost. So we kind of, for our process, see, uh, have categorized the roadmap in five kind of major buckets process, capabilities, equipment, software, and applications kind of lines up with the working groups, although not exactly. But um, so let's talk about each of these a little bit. So for the process, right now our process works with using commercial off-the-shelf things. Um, but that doesn't mean that we think it's remotely optimized for what we're doing. Um, so there's definitely a lot of room here for improvements. We think, um, well, we, even in the past several years, we've definitely seen printers that are becoming faster, bigger, um, improved um, polymer printers. Um, we have kind of on our wish list, low cost, uh, multi-axis printers. Um, people ask me all the time about using resin. We have done a few trials, but not a lot of work starting to look at resins as an option. Um, we've also had some discussion about ultimately, you know, rather than these multi-axis printers, would it be make more sense to have robots that could, um, you know, adjust to any access at all to, to do this kind of print complexity that we're often trying to do. Some other things that are kind of off the shelf things that we use, but you know, we think potentially could be customized and improved is the filament itself. Um, just because something works off the shelf doesn't mean that it's designed for the end use. So um, at least I hypothesize that improved polymers, if we were, if the polymers were designed for what we're actually doing, as opposed to us just buying things and making it work. Similarly, the ceramic coating, um, we think that this could be improved in a number of ways. Um, not the least of which is improving the drying time. And that's actually the key bottleneck in our process right now is actually, well, the printing time takes a certain amount of time, but then the next thing that's really can take a long time is, is just the coating drying. And that's just waiting for the water to evaporate. So there's lots of things here, I think are potential ways to improve the process. Um, other areas for process related processes are alloy capabilities. So we've done a lot of um, proof of concept de demonstrating a bunch of different materials in the process. Essentially, anything that has a melting point above aluminum appears that it is feasible um, as long as it doesn't require being melted in a vacuum. So metals like titanium that are super reactive in the molten state, um, probably not a good idea to expose them to polymer that gets vaporized and then decomposes into water vapor. So our expectation of that is that that would probably explode. Um, so we're not planning to try titanium in this process. Um, similarly, uh, low carbon steels, um, things like um, vacuum induction melted, vacuum arc remelted Vimbar steels, um, likely they will get contaminated with oxides um, and potentially even the carbon from the polymer itself just um, and and disrupt the uh, material properties. So probably those aren't great choices as well. But we're working on a bunch of different alloys, have inquiries on all kinds of things, um, and we're currently working to try to demonstrate um, statistical equivalence in a number of alloy families as well. 
But the data we have so far is that the castings appear to be equivalent as the same heat cast in other methods. Another process thing that we're starting to do some work in is um, a process that I call solidification isostatic pressing. Um, it has other names, um, but it's basically during solidification, you apply pressure to try to close up any porosity um, during the solidification process. So the goal here is to replace hip. Um, this is process that is used in other casting processes, so it's not um, you know, unheard of, but it is not something that we have previously used um, at school, and it's not something we've used at all in the AMEC process. So I think this area has a, a lot of potential, um, in, especially in um, new equipment systems. Um, so the next kind of area we look at is with respect to capabilities. Um, right now, we do not know the entire process window um, for the AMEC process. So there's kind of two key points there. There's the how hard is it to print a given design? You know, is it printable? Um, and then even if it is printable, you know, is the design then castable? Um, so we're still trying to figure out like the clear capability window for these things. Um, you know, this impacts things such as ge all kinds of geometry types of things, wall thickness. Uh, we've done down to about um, one millimeter thick walls, that's definitely very much uh, pushing the envelope. Um, and it also is somewhat dependent on how long and how big is that structure, because at some point there's just not enough thermal mass to do that vaporization step. Um, on, the, on the other side of things, on the maximum side, we don't really know that either. Um, there may be limitations, there may be things that just need to be designed better. So we're still definitely trying to figure all that out. Um, we've done a little bit of work, but not a lot with channels. Um, that somewhat depends on diameter and length. Um, like this gear you see here on the um, bot center bottom, that hole is 3.30 seconds, um, which is very thin. And it's actually smaller than you would typically say is possible in conventional um, casting, typically especially for the thickness of that part, which I think is about three quarters of an inch. Um, but we don't necessarily have design rules yet for this. Um, and we haven't done really any work yet with lattices. But I don't expect lattices would work unless they were um, at least you know, bigger than you would typically see in um, um, powder bed fusion. I, those tiny lattices, I suspect, are not possible. But some other capabilities. So we've started kind of trying to, you know, document what we do know about the process. Ultimately, we do want to have design guides for the AMEC process. Uh, but very basic, well, kind of outlining what we know so far. But we we have put this uh, kind of very basic, uh, you know, decision tree out there for people if they are interested. But at some point. Um, we're like, yeah, probably not going to work based on what we know to date. There's kind of this in between of maybe, and then there's the green where it's like, yeah, probably that will work. The future equipment that we are um, working on, I mentioned the lightning metal. We um, right now that equipment's designed for about a seven inch um, envelope cubed, uh, about a ten inch part max in aluminum. We envision in the future there will be additional sizes, um, potentially adding um, hotter metals that would require induction melding. This system is actually designed for people who don't have a foundry, um, as well as for people who do have a foundry. There is a big interest in the foundry industry on what somebody at the last AFS additive conference started talking about. He called it the Bridgeport Mill of AM casting. That's what he wanted. And as soon as he said this concept, like everybody there was like, yes, that's what we want. That is a great metaphor. Um, this metaphor only makes sense if you know what a Bridgeport Mill is. Um, so if you don't, I'll explain it to you. So if you Google Bridgeport Mill, it'll come up with these machines you see here. Um, they are pretty low cost, um, easy to use, easy to train somebody on. Um, this devices for um, doing milling. Um, so you can see here, I mean, 
less than all of these are less than thirty thousand dollars. So this is kind of the thing that the foundry industry wants to be able to use for equipment for casting. They don't want million dollar sand printers. Um, so this is something that we are working on trying to develop something that can address this need that we see in the industry um, based around the AMAC process. We've also had some discussions on containerized systems, larger envelopes, systems, more automation, et cetera. Um, but a, a lot of that is definitely farther down the road. Um, software, this probably is the area that of the um, roadmap that's probably the least specific at this point, partly because I am not a software person. Um, we do know there's probably slicer improvements that can make things easier. Uh, we know that ideally there would be a computational model. Uh, there's not a good computational model right now for even for regular lost foam, let alone um, the AMAC process. So that is something that's kind of a wish list. Um, and ultimately, I have a goal that you would have automation to take something from CAD and get it to the final um, parameters that you need and then you could just execute that and it would work the first time every time right that's kind of the dream i think of all the additive um, digital manufacturing processes so we're quite a ways i think from that end goal with software but i do think that's down the line eventually and then i do want to talk a second about um, future applications um, we are definitely working in the area of that most um, metal additive is in you know, tooling, aerospace, defense, a little bit in medical, not so much since we can't do titanium, um, but all kinds of other end markets and applications. Um, some of them you might think of, some of them might be a little bit like less obvious, things like art um, and just like general machine shops wanting a solution so they can save on machining and not have to completely carve out apart from bar stock. Uh, so, there's definitely a long way to go um, on the AMEC process. Um, there are basically, from what I can tell, um, four published papers on this area of manufacturing processes. Um, by comparison, when last time I went to Google Scholar and looked up powder bed fusion, there was something like 87,000 papers. Um, so there's a lot that we know that we haven't published, um, talking about at high level here. Um, but there has not been a lot of um, research effort in this area yet. Um, I will, I guess, kind of say one more thing is a lot of times people ask about TRL. Um, TRL really applies to a component. So you have the TRL applied to a system, right? Like our uh, lightning metal system, we'd probably say that's at TRL 6.7 right now. Um, or TRL could apply for the process on a given component, but applying a TRL to a manufacturing process at overall doesn't really make sense. It's kind of like, what's the TRL of welding? Well, the, pro the question doesn't make sense. Um, so generally, you have to have TRL on some manufactured thing. Um, so it's very variable what the TRL of AMEC itself is. Um, so I end on like, one little bit before I kind of open up in questions. So I used to work in forecasting. Um, I spent about four years at Emerson as their forecast manager. So a little bit of predictions here of where we're really going, both as an industry um, as well as you know, you know, school's vision of things going forward. Um, so we do think there's going to be increased focus on energy efficiency, especially in manufacturing. Um, I think that that's likely as we go forward. Um, I do think there's going to be increased focus on AM enabled technology, um, that AM is for metal and not just with metal. I think that most people do not necessarily care how their parts are manufactured. And you know, as a materials person, I'm, and I'm getting a PhD in manufacturing engineering, it's kind of like pains me to say that no one really cares about how it's manufactured. They just want the thing, the part, whatever it is, they want their need met um, and they don't necessarily care how it's done most of the time. Um, so I think having a broader vision of what does, you know, metal and AM mean um, is important. And at least in our, you know, we're using additive manufacturing, you know, to make metal, but we're not using metal um, 3D printing directly, right? We are using it indirectly with polymer printing. Um, 
Um, and finally, I know there's been a lot of um, struggling, particularly in this, you know, stock market with the additive companies and things like that. And I think there are definitely current economic challenges. Um, but I actually expect that the longer term forecasts and even some of the impacts of some of these technologies, I actually th am very optimistic. And I think a lot of these are probably understated on what's going to happen in the long term. Um, so with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I will open it up to any questions people have. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Sarah. Um, we'll now head into the Q&A session. Uh, as a reminder, if you do have questions for Sarah and you haven't done so already, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. And then if you want to come off mute, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can come off and ask your question. I'll go ahead and start off with one we have here. Um, so Sarah, for aluminum, what would you say the TRL level of your process is? Yeah, so so that's a that's a good question. It kind of relates to what I was just saying. So it really depends because it's not it's component specific, right? So we've definitely done a lot of work in aluminum. Um, you know, most of our work probably the last year or year and a half has been in aluminum because it, we even we installed aluminum melting capacity ourselves um, late uh, twenty twenty two. Um, so that's probably aluminum and iron cast irons are the farthest along in the technology development but it really depends on the geometry of the specific component um some things we definitely could look at and say yeah we can make that now and then some things are like mm, that's going to take a little bit of um development to get a given component to work i guess some things we'll look at and say no that's not going to work <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you uh let's see so what would you think i guess what can you give us an example of a situation where you would use a different metal AM process instead of the AMEC process? Yeah, so a lot of times we do get parts and we'll look at them and, and say, well, this is probably better for something else. Um, partly because um, on the small end of the very fine things, that's where AMEC starts not working as best. It's It works better for larger things. So if it's very small, if it's got you know tiny lattices like you know, I'll look at those and be like, yeah, that's probably a powdery fusion part or a binder jet part. Um, yeah, so a lot of times that's kind of like the first cut is, yeah, is it even look remotely appropriate for our process? And then there's okay. also the materials, like the materials that will work. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. And then what what process do you think is your biggest competition? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it depends on the component. Um, but I would say probably the biggest competition from our perspective is, um, you know, people just taking a, a ingot or, you know, piece of bar stock and just machining it from bar stock mm -hmm. is probably the biggest competition. Like, if, like, cause that's like the, in, you know, the default. Yep. Yep. Understood. All right, thank you. All right, so let's see. So with with the polymers that you are using, um, are there concerns with the va the vaporization gases, um, like for from an operator exposure perspective? And if so, how how do you mitigate those? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, so we are doing work um, to kind of investigate that uh, at um, Oak Ridge National Lab to you know looking at. Um, um, was it called TGA and mass spectrometer to, um, you know, ensure that the the, you know, fumes are safe or you know appropriately, you know, keeping the operator safe. Um, for the lightning metal system, it's actually designed so that um, the gases are pulled through um, a vacuum and then into um, water to solidify the polymer so that it's not you know minimizing any exposure like that. No, oh, very nice. All right, let's see. So how is the surface finish coming out of your process? Yeah, it, 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 it varies, but it tends to match the print. Um, so depending on your print settings, depending on the, you know, the angle of what the print um, is, it's very much dependent on that. I would say like rough numbers, 
probably around um, 300 RA if I had to had to you know put down something like typical. Mm-hmm. Okay. And let's see, can you say what polymer that you are using? Yeah, we don't. I mean, that's that's kind of public knowledge out there. I mean, at least some places. Yeah, we we tend to use PLA, um, and we can use um, natural because we don't know what the um, dyes are doing, like could potentially do from a safety perspective. Um, we, you know, we don't know what those chemicals are in there. Okay, let's see. This might be a good one. So in the in the V process, you can print a set of reverse models once, vacuum encase them in a thin plastic film, and get your sand molds repeatedly to cast your parts. How does this compete with Amic? I wonder if Mark's still on the phone. Mark, are you still on the phone? <laughs> the phone a friend on that. Um, so he dropped off. Um, I do understand your question. So. Um, I don't have a good sense of the cost structure in the V process. Um, so I don't know that I can actually answer that. Um, I could always take that question, question down and then you could follow up. <laughs> yeah, I'll see if it. you'd like to. All right, sounds good. All right, so let's see. Yeah, I How guess the big thing is, right? is is having is tooling right i guess i would say i guess now that i think about it a little bit like we would typically not use amec for like five thousand pieces let's say like unless the geometry required additive like at some point we will tool it up and convert it to regular lost foam um i guess so then I guess it's more of a question, but I'll have to get back to you on the V process details. Okay. Sounds good. Let's see. We got one more here. So if you have any questions, get them in. Uh, how does the AMIC process compare to lost wax investment in terms of possible part geometries? Yeah, so I think there are things that both processes can do that are kind of... Um, some can do better in lost wax and some that AMIC can do better. So generally lost wax, I would say, is much better for very small things. Um, if you're trying to talk about like, um, I don't know, like a hundred pound part, you're probably not going to want to do that in lost wax. Um, it, the other difference really is on time. Um, that's where the big difference is. Uh, but as far as part geometries, I think um, investment casting is, is is definitely on like super fine details. Um, but the other thing is um, interior channels where you're having to in, in investment cast lost wax investment casting, you'll have to um, dissolve um, the ceramic coating, right? If it's like an interior channel, because whereas in Amec and lost foam, um, the coating will fall off because it's so much thinner. Okay, gotcha. All right, so we got someone with their hand up. All right, Tom, you want to go ahead and come off mute now? Ask your questions. Yeah, good day. I'll, I'll be the first to show my face. Um, a question, maybe related to the, the previous one, and a comment you made around the you know, the availability of this technology. In, I guess the conventional supply base, like you guys are aiming on making parts and making machines at this point. How do you see that changing? How do you see this process being adopted by, you know, the the existing supply base in terms of investment casting or sand casting? How does this fit in? You know, how do you see interest um, from from that existing supply base of the companies that are interested in this technology and adopting it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um... I would say that, and no offense if there are any foundries on the call, um, because you may not be applicable to what I'm, what I'm about to say, but I would say foundries in general are not the early adopters of technology, generally speaking. Um, the ones that are that we are talking to, they tend to be captive, right? So there's somebody internally in some company that you know, has an additive interest and in, in, is planning to force this on their foundry as opposed to like um, 
kind of the standalone foundries wanting to adopt it. That that is definitely kind of what we're seeing. I think that that's kind of why we started developing this um, lightning metal approach. And that is this is a system for people who are not foundries to be able to adopt the process. Um, I think there's more interest that way actually than um, at least at this time. I think I think with time as you know more and more people you know as you see demand things like that then I think they're you know more of the followers on the innovation adoption curve. Mm -hmm. Okay thank you. All right let me just check one more time. All right, so I don't see any more hands up and I don't see any more questions coming into the chat. So I think that's going to wrap up today's TRX webinar. Uh, I would like to say, thank Sarah once again for the great presentation. Uh, if you do have further questions, you can reach out to Sarah directly. Do you have your 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 email? You want to share that last slide one more time, Sarah? Oh, I'll just put it in my in the chat. Sounds good. All right. And as a reminder, if you are interested in presenting in a TRX webinar, um, I will go ahead and drop that link in the chat one more time as well. Uh, you can go follow that link, go ahead and put your information in and we'll reach out to you. So thanks everyone for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for jumping in, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.